We are talking Michigan football with all of you for the next 60 minutes right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you stopping by on the Voice of College Football. Leave those comments and questions, and uh, please consider the Super Chat as well. My name is Mark. John is on a business trip. He will be back next week to host your fine show, but I am the guy that hosted it for a long, long time. Uh, we got TJ Konerski down below. You can catch him on Ronin Sports Talk. You'll see the banner here in just a second. It's a right on X slash Twitter and Ferris Khan's here. Who's been producing some excellent analytics videos for us here at the voice of college football maze and blue. Hey guys, how are we doing tonight? Uh, doing, doing great. great man. It was yeah. great to see you with the Michigan background drop. It, it fits you. The maize and blue really fits you, Mark. So <laughs> we're in not here not here but in, but a little in the uh in the uh, uh the graphic the intro there so yeah oh so excellent thumbnail so yeah yeah very good yes also yes. a quick little shout out to the michigan hockey team they're in the final four uh no team no hockey slash football team has made the final four ever in the same academic season michigan's done it three years in a row no other team. So Michigan's done it three years in a row. Who else would do that? I can think of Notre Dame. Ohio State. And I guess Ohio State's, are they that good in hockey that they could pull that off? I mean, they're competitive some years. Uh, okay. Yeah, they're, they're actually pretty competitive. When I think of college hockey, I basically think of Minnesota, yep. North Dakota, Michigan, and maybe somebody in the Northeast really good. Like, Boston College, Boston Denver, College, somebody like Denver's, that. Denver's Denver's really good. Denver, yes, yes. I, I was acquainted with the Frozen Four when I worked at ESPN, and we would show it. But uh, it's been a long, long time. Yeah, shout out to Rod. Uh, the US, the uh, OSU woman did win the um, the national championship in in hockey. Michigan does not have a team yet, but hopefully soon. Yep. Okay, that I did not know either. All right. Well, let's get it cranked up talking Michigan football and everybody can blame me. I'm the one that uh, caused our delay. So pilot on me and we will make up for it right now. TJ, let's start with you in regards to spring football. Of course, uh, we are looking ahead to a spring game on April 20th. So we're just about two and a half weeks away from that. Uh, what are the good words coming out of Ann Arbor? Yeah, so we're about two weeks into into practice, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of good coming out right now. We got uh, the defense is dominating, which is to be expected early in the uh, you know the whole spring practice portion. They're a little bit ahead of the offense, but what's really throwing the offense off is uh, a lot of blitz packages, which we can come to expect with Wink Martindale. But they're also doing a bunch of different stunts, and we have we have a new starting five offensive line, so they got to get used to each other, build chemistry. But I want to touch on some, uh, you know, early risers right now. And uh, a few names, uh, Enao Etta, uh, who's playing uh, the four-tech, five-tech, which was previously the Chris Jenkins role. He's a name to look out for. Now, um, probably Rayshon Benny is going to be the starter this season once he heals up from his injury. But Enao Etta is the name to watch. And another name to watch who's going to be the Sam, uh, Sam linebacker position, possibly rush end is uh, TJ Guy. So both these guys are turning heads in camp. These are names to know. And then uh, the linebacking core right now with Jay Sean Barnum and Ernest Hausman are just tearing it up. I mean, uh, all word all word from camp is that these two dudes just look uh, heat-seeking missiles. I mean, they're just, you know, they're tearing it up. They're looking promising. So we shouldn't see too much of a drop-off or potentially a step up from Junior Colson and uh, uh, Michael Barrett. And then uh, I want to hit on uh, – our tight end two, Marlon Klein. So everyone knows about Colson Loveland, right? But Marlon Klein is a, a recruit out of Georgia we got previously from Germany. And uh, he's our tallest tight end, our strongest tight end, and our fastest tight end. So uh, they're saying he's turning heads in camp. He's looking good. Um, and then there are some concerns we could talk about with camp, but I don't know if Ferris has any comments on more positivity he's hearing. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I didn't want to have background noise, and I, and I muted there. So, yeah, uh, great to hear about the uh, offensive line. Um, uh, you know, we're certainly – I mean, it's just unprecedented, uh, a, potentially 11 players on offense uh, that might get drafted, uh, the entire line plus another player on top of that. So, 
it, it's great to hear in my in my analysis. You know, basically, it wasn't kind of the weakest link on offense, but it wasn't the strength either. Uh, you know, in terms of the amount of production that was leaving, ESPN has a metric for that. Uh, you know, production lost. Um, I guess I want to try to do a little bit better than the ESPN. <laughs> so I created my own little metric. There'll be a video about it tomorrow. Uh, and uh, it would be lo- it would be great. Maybe we could crowdsource this to a certain degree and kind of talk about kind of strengths and weaknesses. I would say kind of lukewarm. I mean, it's great to hear all of this uh, um, from camp. From an mm-hmm. analytics perspective, I would say, um, you know, best offensive line, best offensive line two years in a row. Last year, maybe arguably the best offensive line. So maybe three years in a row. Is that going to happen, you know, uh, in the fall? I- I'm not sure that that's the case. So uh, that's my comment there. Now, uh, with Marlon Klein, um, second on the depth chart, it'll be very interesting to see what what happens uh, there. I mean, if if uh, if that's a breakout, I mean, it's a breakout. It's a um, next man up kind of position. Tight end is super important. So so that that's going to be fantastic. Uh uh, based on what you just said there. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we run a lot of two tight end sets and, uh, you know, we rotate our tight end. So I, I really think he's going to be a safety valve for uh, whatever quarterback wins the competition this spring. Okay. Uh, one other quick note, uh, Jay Sean uh, Barnum, I, I projected that as one of the weaker links on defense uh, because junior Colson is going to be a high draft pick. And yeah. Um, so uh, so that's also great to hear. So so it seems like the areas where, you know, in my analysis, might there might be some weaknesses, uh, you know, maybe people are, you know, we're, we're having players that step up. So that's great. Yeah. So are we ready to flip to the negative? Okay. So the there are, yeah, okay. so the, there are some concerns in camp right now. Um, you know, you can contribute this to an elite defense. You can contribute to this to a new uh, defensive coordinator, potentially giving the offense uh, new looks, or a new offensive line who's still looking to gel and build chemistry. But the word out of camp right now is uh, the quarterbacks have no time to read their progressions. Uh, they're not they're not making their throws. Uh, it's looking concerning for the quarterback position at the moment. It's still early in camp. Um, Orgy looked more promising week one than week two. Uh, so, you know, and that's a big concern. The big question mark for Michigan is quarterback and wide receiver. Um, there are no wide receivers, uh, standing out right now. They want, like a lot of people are hoping Samaj Morgan really breaks out this year, which he very well may, but they want Samaj Morgan to be more than just a gadget player. They want him to be a crisper route runner and he has to still develop into that. Tyler Morris is probably the best well-rounded receiver on the roster right now. Um, and he's going to be your, uh, your, 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 uh, I'm sorry, your slot receiver, your Y, but we don't have a true X. So that's the problem. So Samaj is going to be your Z. We don't have a true X. Uh, they still got to identify that possibly in the portal. We'll see. Um, and then that's kind of the concern right now is the offense is just not getting in rhythm and sync. It's still early, but those are the current concerns. When you look at uh, Alex Ortiz's evaluation, scouting report, and ranking coming out of high school, Yep. And then you see that he's thrown one pass in college. Yes. I, I'm trying to understand, and of course I'm not there at practice watching him. Maybe he's shown that level of ability to compete for a job like at a Michigan. But when you put those two things together, the the mm-hmm. hope of him being a Michigan-level quarterback, I'd like to know where that's coming from. Yeah, so I mean, I guess the argument would be, I mean, so I just want to let you know, I, I hear you, and I, I, I'm, I feel very similar to you because I've not seen it myself um, outside of the spring game where he only threw two passes. But, um, you know, I remember when you were talking about Joe Milton a few years ago when all that hype was building, and you discussed his percentage in high school, his uh, uh, completion percentage. Well, the same thing for Orgy; it's in the fifties, right? So, um, very concerning. Um, I, I guess the argument would be they've had three years of tape on him. They're familiar with him. They know what he can do. Um, but we just got to hope he develops and becomes a fairly above 62% completion percentage quarterback. I mean, I don't know. I personally, Mark, I think we might be portal shopping for a quarterback. I, I, but they need to evaluate the kids and see you know what they have. Yeah, my, my thoughts on this are uh... – 
uh, a little bit different. I, you know, I think, or I believe that Alex Orgy can complete a forward pass. So, so I believe in a real game. <laughs> so, so I think that can happen. Uh, can it be in the 60% range? I think it can happen if we keep the denominator low, you know, uh, so, so not that many p passes, you know, with some completion. Um, you know, I talked in a previous video, I talked about a two quarterback system. I don't believe it would be probable, but it would be possible if uh, Alex Orgy is dif different enough and the other quarterback is uh, uh, Denegal, uh, let's say, who's a better passer. Um, so, you know, that is an option. I don't think they're going to go portal shopping. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I do think that there's hope that uh, Alex Orgy 2024 could be something like Jalen Mil Milrow in 2023. But, you know, I looked at the numbers with Milrow and we have to give him a lot of credit. I mean, Milrow had a fantastic year passing uh, last year, and that is going to be very hard to replicate. Uh, it's going to be hard to replicate JJ. It's also going to be rep hard to replicate Milrow for those of us who kind of think, hey, you know, uh, Alex Orgy is just, just like Milrow. He can kind of take that role next year. Yeah, I've certainly, you can blame me for making those comparisons, but I didn't make it like I'm making a prediction. Alex Orgy is going to be Jalen Milrow. I was watching the Rose Bowl, and even before that, thinking, is this what Michigan's hoping for next year? Is that Alex Orgy becomes Jalen Milrow? Because here you got this big Cam Newton body type. Yeah. And so, you know, he can run and bowl over guys. He's got a strong enough arm. Jalen Milrow, the, the improvement from week two against Texas, three to four or five weeks later, you know, yeah. it's not like he was hitting on 80% of his passes, but he was hitting on like deep shots, like with precision. And it's going to be important for this coaching staff. Of course, you guys know this better than I do to to if Alex Orgy does emerge as the starting quarterback to do what he does best. And that's one thing that Bama figured out with Jalen Milrow. Okay, we're going to simplify the offense and basically make it there's your read, and then you take off and run if that guy's not open. And that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, related to that, quick question for TJ. Do you do you think Michigan is going to really um cater their offense? to uh, the quality of players or the strengths of the players that we have. I, I do. I just want to kind of thought uh, your thoughts on that. We're, we're not going to go back to the days of uh, making a, a system and making the players kind of fit that system. I, you know, I think we are going to be adaptable. Yeah, I, I know that that's already been uh, confirmed that they're going to whatever quarterback wins the battle, they're going to, you know, conform the offense to adapt the offense to. Um, you know, and I think you might see what Mark was saying that if the option isn't there, take it and run because Orgy can run and he can be a threat on the ground, obviously. Um, you know, really, we need Orgy to just be consistent and solid with the short to intermediate throws and then occasionally give, you know, a defense, make a defense honest with a deep shot every now and then. I mean, that's that's probably the strategy. You know, we do have Kirk Campbell as the quarterback uh, coach so and offensive coordinator now. So he is a bit of a mechanic guru. You know, we saw with, we saw the progression with JJ. Where I guess they're hoping that they can fix him. You know, I, I do have concerns like Mark. Though I'm very I'm very unsure about this. Uh, I'm nervous personally, but I hope it works out. I am right, sitting here scanning the country, and I'll do this more formally for what quarterback situation is out there where a very capable player could lose the quarterback battle and would be an upgrade for Michigan. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's hopefully the route they go if they don't find the guy who can lead the, uh, the offense, you know I mean? But you know, rumors are right now, Mark, and I don't know if you can confirm this or if you have your ear to the ground, but uh, quarterbacks are demanding like a million dollars out of the portal starting mm -hmm. quarterbacks. So, uh, you know, is Michigan now, you know, all word is they have the funds. They can do it. But will they do it? Because we've not seen the high school. Uh, we've not seen Michigan be aggressive with the high school prospects with the NIO, only their own. So, um, you know, we'll we'll see if, you know, things change this, this uh, portal. 
yeah, I see a message from uh, or a, 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 a chat uh, from uh, Ralph here talking about uh, Julian Sayan. Uh, would be very interesting. I'm going to kind of bring up the name Jack Tuttle because uh, Sayan and Tuttle are both from Southern California, from neighboring towns right next to each other. It'd be kind of cool if, if they played in the game. What I'll say is that Jack Tuttle offers a floor that's higher than people who are really doom and gloom. You know, he, he's been, he was a four star recruit. He's been around for seven years. He might go ahead and just beat Ohio State and, and go straight into collecting Social Security checks or something. Um, you know, uh, so at least we have that. We have a floor and it's possible that Jack Tuttle could actually um, compete for the job in the fall as well. You know, may, maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's some approach where, hey, you know what, Texas is too too early in the year. Let's not do anything crazy. Let's just let the experienced Jack Tuttle to, uh, handle that. And then we'll figure out the quarterback situation for the rest of the year after that. You know, to play devil's advocate, though, because, you know, I've heard the Jack Tuttle argument, but like, what has Jack Tuttle done at Indiana to give people the confidence? Because if you look at his numbers, he's barely hitting 60 percent completion. You know, he's he's thrown for what at most. Um, I just had it up here. Four hundred yards. Most, um, uh, yeah, 423 in a season. Yeah, with a two to five touchdown interception ratio. Like, I just don't have, you know, I don't have the confidence there. You know, like Michigan is a blue blood, blue blood program that just came off a national championship, right? We are a three time college football playoff uh, team. We should have a higher talent level in the QB room. Now, I understand with Harbaugh's departure and and the unknown was JJ going to declare for the draft or not declare for the draft. We got screwed in this last portal. So like, that's understandable. And uh, you know, we got, we had, we had to deal with the Harbaugh dance. Right. But if Michigan cannot put out a quarterback who is capable of running a power five offense, that's a knock, you know, and I don't think Jack Tuttle's the savior. I know people want to think he is because he's a, an upperclassman, but to me personally, I'm not confident with that path. Yeah, I, I, I agree. He's not the savior. I, I'd look at him as more of the safety net. He's like the he's like the um, the floor. <laughs> you know, we yeah. can do Jack Tuttle or better. Uh, just curious on your thoughts on uh, Jaden Davis, and if you think he has any chance of of winning the job or. Uh, you know, I heard within his own family, they want him to be a, a, a red shirt. I don't know what you're hearing. Yeah. On that. Go ahead. yeah. So he actually is, he's actually been the name that's come up the most in spring camp. Uh, he's thrown some, you know, promising balls. He looks poised for a freshman, but you know, the thing about Jaden Davis uh, and I'm high on Jaden Davis, you know, there's some debate within the Michigan community. Um, I just don't see Sean Moore putting his first season on a freshman quarterback, especially when you face a team like Texas in week two, that's a lot of pressure for a freshman. Um, but hey, he might not have a choice either. Like maybe not week two, but maybe week six. If we don't have the quarterback situation figured out, you know, he may go to Jaden Davis. Although I just have a hard time believing in Sharon Moore's first season, you, you see Jaden Davis, a true freshman, uh, you know, taking the lead for the Michigan Wolverine offense. I mean, that's the type of stuff that like a Trevor Lawrence does or a or a, a Jameson Winston. I mean, those are the elites, you know, very rare. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we did run only like we did the second half of Penn state, <laughs> did, yeah. did, I, I'm just, you know, hypothetically okay. for, yeah, for, okay. for, for a, a quarter or something, yeah. uh, could you see us getting five and a half yards versus a Texas or an Ohio state or something with, um, with the backs that we have in orgy running? to a certain point, but eventually they're going to load that box. I mean, eventually the defense is just going to be – I mean, I know we were able to pull it off against Penn State, but you also had Blake Corum running the ball with a J.J. threat, right? So that's – that's J.J. keeps him honest. Now, if you have a quarterback who can't throw the damn ball, like a Joe Milton was unable to do in 2020, um, does the defense – I don't know. I, I don't know if we – against the Texas – I mean, they did lose their defensive tackles though, right? So maybe Texas is vulnerable. I don't know their depth chart. Um I, I say it'd be tough. It, 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 it would definitely wouldn't be easy. Um, this, when teams sell out against the run, it gets hard. Now we are a, an extremely power run game, and we do have the running backs, I and mean, that's the thing. So I didn't mention this in the spring update, but the running backs are looking good. Donovan Edwards is looking good. Cleo Mullins is looking good. Ben Hall, 
there's a lot of promise with Ben Hall. And, you know, a lot of people think he has the best vision on the team. So uh, I don't know. I just don't know if we might not have the season we want if that's the path we have to go down, you know, and it could be some frustrating games, which uh, concern me. Low scoring, frustrating, you know, like like the Iowa game we had, what, two years ago or was what, or three years ago and it was like nine to three. So we want to avoid that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, the game they sacked uh, Nate Stanley about 11 times. Yeah. In the big house. Yeah, and we'll have the defense. I mean, we'll have the defense to do it. It's just, uh, and this quarterback situation has got to be solved. You know, I mean, there's got to be a quarterback available. I just, I, I can't, there is. There's someone sitting on the bench or there's someone at a group of five level who's capable. <clears throat> no question. You know, well, Ohio State seems to have a half dozen five stars, so uh, maybe one of those falls falls through there. So, <laughs> but but I I am more optimistic about the quarterback position. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I think you know Flores Tuttle. I think uh, you know Denegal is going to be a decent quarterback. It appears, you know, from from what we know, uh, and then Orgy has that upside of uh, you know uh, of a Milrow. So I, I think between the room in the room there's a way to make it work that, uh, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more optimistic without going to uh, the transfer portal. I, th I think we should go elsewhere for the transfer portal personally. So. But the way you guys were, I'm sorry, the way you guys were sizing up the Texas game. And I know this is worst case scenario. Yeah. It was like a situation that a team, the caliber of Michigan should never be in unless there's been some ridiculous rash of injuries. You're down to your third quarterback and you're trying to protect him and you're trying to nurse him along and you're afraid to let him risk throwing the ball downfield. Like you don't want to go through a season like that. Right. Trying to nurse every game through yeah. 17 to 10. Yeah. Right. I think, you know, one of the challenges with Michigan schedule in 2024 versus 23 is that you know we just had this massive long preseason for lack of a better term <laughs> until we had our you know tough games at the end of the year this year it's not anything like that so yeah i mean it's um there's got to be a plan for texas uh you know i believe that michigan can beat texas and you know i don't think that that's you know just a giveaway game um uh but but i think um you, you've got to make them think that's that's why I was kind of proposing the idea that if there was a two quarterback system in the first game then you're then it's a big question mark on Texas they have to prepare a little bit more you know maybe that's that's a, that can be used to a strategic advantage and then you can play the hot hand in in in, in that game uh to try to win it so uh I think Texas on paper is a better team than Michigan but it is being played in Ann Arbor and I do believe that Michigan should have a really good chance to win that game. 100%. Yeah, I think we can win it. Uh, you know, it's just the unknown makes it hard to predict, you know. Right, folks, we appreciate you being here at the Voice of College Football for our Michigan Wolverines live show that we present every Tuesday, 8 o'clock Eastern time for all of you. We got TJ from Ronin Sports Talk here. We got Ferris Khan. Check out Ferris's uh, videos. One posted today. I believe that was the offense and the defense tomorrow or in a couple days, I believe. We're posting that on Thursday, uh, an analytics look at uh, both sides of the football. All right. Let's see. Next up, where are we going? Do we want to go to recruiting? Um, not everyone's yeah. satisfied at this point about where 2025 stands, DJ. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, there is a lot of, I mean, there is some concern from the fan base because it's been so dry, um, you know, coming off a national championship, having the new coach smell, um, being a three-time big 10 champion, you know, where's the bump in recruiting, um, you know, and, and, you would say, well, there was a lot of turbulence in the offseason with the coaching change, but you see in other programs where the coaching change actually brings uh, a big bump in recruiting. You know, they call it the new coach smell, like I, I previously mentioned. Um, and 
I think some of it's 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 valid. You know, I actually think a lot of it's valid. Um, but you know, the today actually, which is nice, there's actually been a nice wave in predictions for Michigan for some key players, uh, such as uh, Taz Williams, who's a wide receiver out of Texas. He's more your your Z type wide receiver, a uh, Henry Ruggs, if you will, type of receiver. Uh, He's previously from Pennsylvania, but he's a, a very good wide receiver. He might be the next one to drop. If, if I had to make a prediction who would be the next to commit to Michigan, I would put him because he visits this weekend. And there's a lot of uh, momentum with him right now. Uh, another top uh, recruit who got uh, predicted today was Dwayne Galloway, who's a top 100 corner out of Columbus, Ohio, Mark. Are you familiar with him? You familiar? No, familiar? I'm not. I'm not a recruiting guy. All okay. the recruiting stuff I hear is from guys like you. That's okay. it kind of seeps in my brain from having these kind of conversations. Well, but otherwise, well, no, I'm not a recruiting guy. Ohio State's crushing it right now with corners. You guys have like two two of the top five corners in, in the class this season. So it's not like you're hurting. So uh and then we got uh we're leading for Alex Graham, who's a four star uh top two hundred uh defensive back out of IMG Academy. And another big recruit who should, I mean, it's the type of kid who, uh, why aren't you committed yet? His name's Avery Gatch. He's Gash. He's an offensive tackle out of Michigan, uh, uh, top 200 offensive tackle. But, you know, he's one of those kids who wants to, you know, see, wait until the summer before he commits to a program. But that's looking very promising. And then uh, we're making very good progress with a running back out of Ohio, Marquise Davis. Uh, Michigan's climbing the ladder there. And uh, Ohio State's not really giving him the attention that they're giving other uh, recruits like a Bo Jackson or uh, or the big one you guys are being recruited or uh, favored for, which is Jordan Davison out of modern day California. But, uh, you know, those are some of the things that's going on. And then there is a five star that are the best chance for us to land a five star is Andrew Balboa, who is the number 15 overall player and number three uh, offensive tackle out of, out of Kansas. So there is some promise. But. You know, with all that promise, there is the concern of is Michigan doing enough? Because right now we're ranked in the 50s after a national championship. Um, and it's early in the game, right? It means nothing in, in April. Uh, things will pick up this summer. But, you know, the concern is, is NIL where it needs to be? Now, we know the money's been raised. Like, we know there's over $10 million in, in – uh, I know – I the, it's, it's more public now, but there's over $10 million raised. Some of it's going to the current members on the team, so this is why you didn't see the portal jump. But uh, is Michigan willing to give NIL promises to these high school players and become competitive like all the other uh, top programs are doing? And that's the concern. Is the philosophy where it needs to be? Is the strategy where it needs to be? And is there the backing and support of the administration like there is at other top programs across the country? Yeah, TJ, I was going to ask you about the the, the NIL situation because part of it is the money, but also it's um, by player. Once you get to that point, <laughs> you know, you know what what you know what's in it for me. What what do I get as an offensive lineman? What do I get as a wide receiver? You know, what's what's the the hard number? You know, I, I'm not sure to what extent um, Michigan's developed like other programs are. You know, in terms of uh, you know, how that all kind of fits together. You know, maybe there's just a big blob there saying, hey, we've got the money, don't worry about that. But but there may be more hard numbers with, uh, with the competitors to Michigan. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, one of the, I mean, there's a lot of issues here and it's kind of layered to be honest with you, but the reality is some of these programs have been doing NIL, right? For like 30 years. So they have pipelines deep and we're talking about the Alabamas, the Georgias, you know, your Southern programs, your Texases, et cetera. You know, this has been going on since the 60s, uh, you know, some some deeper than others. SMU was one of the most public examples there was, and, and they were made an example of, while other programs, they did, you know, the NCAA turned their head on. But so, you know, so those big money donors, the sugar daddies of those programs, they have been attached to the programs for a long time, like your Texas A&Ms, um, because their donors are actually uh, very aggressive, where they pretty much control the AD and uh, make a lot of calls uh, with the president in terms of like decisions within the program. And Michigan is very conservative in that aspect. So like when NIL became legal, which was 2019 or 2020, fairly recently, uh, Michigan didn't even develop an NIL program or endorse a collective until last year. So we had a, 
every other program had a two year head start. We were two years behind. And then now we're fine. We this past year we started endorsing collectives, but they weren't all in. But since uh, there was a lot of threat of players being poached uh, this past, you know, in January and February, uh, February, a lot of donors have stepped up. The collectives are now more uh, organized and there seems to be a focused structured effort uh, with the program uh, starting, I would say this January, but the results have still not been, uh, we haven't seen the results. You know, we're still waiting on, some type of tangible evidence that it's actually functioning properly. So, I mean, that's just where we are. You know, I would argue that our NIL is not Michigan should be recruited at a top 10 level annually, top 10, not top 15. People want to say top 15. No, not top 15, not top 20, not top 25. It should be a top 10 annual program. It doesn't need to be one, two or five. It doesn't need, we don't need that because kids portal all the time. It means nothing anyways. But you do need to get a foundation of talent, your cornerstone players, and then develop players around those cornerstone players. Because the reality is, and a lot of people want to argue, well, Michigan's been doing it this way for a long time. Uh, look at how we won the national championship. Well, for one, we won the national championship with pre-NIL players. Your Blake Corums, your JJs, your Will Johnson was pre-NIL. Uh, Donovan Edwards, who, who was very big in the playoffs and the Ohio State game, as Mark knows, no shot taken. Uh and uh, these players, Blake Corm has been on record saying if NIL was around when he was a recruit, he may not be at Michigan. Imagine that. You know, that would crush us. So Michigan needs to be more competitive uh, if they want to be competitive going forward. Yeah, just a quick point about, uh, you know, where we need to, you know, it would be great if we had something that was very structured that had to do with the offensive line, where, where it would be sort of known. If I'm a top offensive lineman, I can come to Michigan and here's what I'll get. And it's going to be better than anything else that's out there because Michigan is offensive line university, you know, something to that effect would be awesome. If we, if we had some, um, not just brand overall, but some, you know, like I, I know if I'm a certain type of player, I want to go to Michigan, for, you know, maybe it's offensive line. Maybe it's also when you say, when you say top 10, you know, I, I think a lot of people say, well, aren't there academic restrictions and that maybe we can't be top 10 for that reason? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's an excuse or not. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on that one. Yeah. So in terms of like the academic uh, requirements for Michigan at, at the high school level, it's it's far more lenient than it is for like a, a junior to and to portal from another college because of a credit issue. See, the academic issues in Michigan is more of a credit transfer issue. Like, for example, when uh, when Drake Nugent transferred from Stanford the highest academic uh, program you could transfer from in, in college football. All of his credits didn't even transfer to Michigan. That's how stubborn their admission process is. That's insane. So, um, and also if anything above a 60 credit, so they have a 60 credit threshold, anything above the 60 credit threshold, they won't even allow. You have to have Michigan credits to transfer. And that's why you have trouble with your Terrence Shannons in the world or your Caleb loves in basketball. That's why Juwan Howard was having all that trouble because he was getting upperclassmen to try and transfer. So you either need to be a freshman, a sophomore, or, or a graduate, uh, uh, a graduate uh, transfer. And uh, in terms of uh, a structured system to where an offensive lineman is like, hey, I make this much, what has been discussed in Michigan is a team-based salary. Now, this has been discussed for over a year now. Uh, Jim Harbaugh was trying to put this in place last July through Empower, and uh, we have the money. But it's not in place, and I don't know why. And and I've I've heard theories and rumors uh, from pretty connected people, but like no one's giving me names in terms of is it Ward? Is it is it the Regents? You know, is it Sharon uh, not allowing it? I don't think so. Uh, but I don't know who it is. I have an idea on some Regents who are difficult or stubborn or or archaic. Um, I won't name those names right now because I don't have true confirmation. I just have some hearsay. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess we're going to find out. I think, to be honest, this offseason, this summer is going to be very telling on where we are as a university in terms of recruiting and uh, true uh, administrative support for the football program. Yeah, very, very. Uh, th this whole thing is fascinating to me because, well, first of all, I, I had to redo calculus. That was that was painful. So I, I kind of remember that, you know, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it was the same exact class. So, but uh, but anyway, the uh, you know this whole uh, conversation is fascinating because um, you know there's so many sort of like is Michigan an academic institution? Does it impact the U.S. news rankings, national rankings? How do we stack up with UCLA or how do we stack up with Harvard or Stanford or whatever? Um, does letting a few players that are coming in uh, take us off the board? Does it make us, you know, does it take us from being the number eight, you know, ranked college to not in the top 20 just by doing that? Um, you know, I might do some research on that. I don't know if anybody uh, on this uh, actually knows that, but but that's, that's, uh, that's something to kind of research, you know, a as a regent, what do I care about? I, I do care about kind of that ranking of where Michigan is. Yeah. relative to other universities on the academic side and does the athletics bending, you know, bending the rules or not bending the rules, but, but moving the bar up and down, does that, um, you know, does that impact the overall ranking, you know? Right. I, well, I think that'd be a very interesting, interesting analysis. I know Mark did the, uh, he did the college analysis of like uh, academic uh, rankings and, and uh, you know, I think uh, if if Michigan were to lessen the threshold or the uh, the criteria for an athletic transfer, I personally I don't think it would affect the overall academic standing of the program. Now I'll say this though: there's a very hard position within the university because I'm sure there's people watching this right now. Like, no, don't do that. You can't affect the uh, the prestige of the university academically because, as Mark has pointed out, research dollars. Uh, drive these programs. And it is more important than athletics. And I, I know there are, I've had this argument with people and they talk about how much more is donated through research and other academic uh, donations. And I don't disagree, but it's also true that when you have a competitive ac uh, athletic program, it boosts everything within the university from tuition to admission uh, or in terms of people submitting applications to overall marketing. There's no better, over, there's no better marketing than uh, a college football playoff run, right? So um, I think there's got to be a balance somewhere. I, I do know if they are going to change the uh, the admissions policies for athletes only instead of not just uh, students, but uh, strictly athletes, it starts at Santa Ono to the regions. This is not a ward manual uh, situation. He has no control you over can't the blame uh, ward for this. So. Correct. This is not a ward. Yeah, we can't blame ward for this one. All right. Hey, Mark, just a, just a one little provocative idea for you. Uh, what if, uh, let's say Harvard has a $40 billion endowment. Take, take $1 billion of that, go independent as a football team, and uh, try to see if you can make it to the college football playoffs within four years. Yeah. So what happens to their i don't i'm trying to think how large is their enrollment and what happens when they recruit 100 football players that have to play at that level yeah oh, I, I, stanford specifically like you're talking about academic well experience? i mean yeah it could, could be stanford harvard. Yeah. yeah did you oh you said harvard I said Harvard but yeah, oh. yeah. could be stanford yeah, he was, he was trying yeah. to go really ridiculous <laughs> okay. I, I don't think they i don't think they even know that I, I bet if we went to Harvard tonight and walked around campus and started talking about the the college football playoff of the national championship game, probably like ninety two percent of them don't even know what that is. Well, well, find find three billionaires from Harvard, have them fund it. You know that that could be another way to do it, right? So again, I don't know that they even care. Yeah, but we're looking at so when you guys were having the the, the conversation and trying to find that. Okay, who else recruits in the top 10 and has those kind of academic standing? And the first school that came to mind for me was Notre Dame. Yep. And now I'm looking at the public university rankings and I'm seeing that UCLA is ranked right there with Michigan. Now they're not recruiting quite at that level, but they have in the past. Uh, those are about the only ones I can come up with. Yeah, Ralph mentioned USC, maybe. Yeah, so so USC is a private uh, university, right? UCLA. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Ralph also mentioned USC. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, 
I, from my understanding, USC does have an athletic, uh, they allow the athletes to come in at a different requirement academically. Um, okay. So that would be one loophole. Now, Notre Dame, for example, they have a team-based salary. Michigan does not have a team-based salary. So that's, that's one limitation, you know. Um, plus, Notre Dame gets a very big recruiting boost with the Catholic, you know, private schools for uh, high school players. I mean, you can almost nail a, uh, a Notre Dame uh, recruit just by the school he goes to, you know. So that, that does help them. So, TJ, do you think that this recruiting – let's say lack of a surge in recruiting is strictly mm -hmm. a, you know, you went through the history of the NIL collective and when it started and then it was a year or two or three late yeah. compared to the competition. And that's technically two or three years late right. or decades late. Yeah. Um, do you think the other big factor is the Harbaugh uncertainty? Oh, that has put them behind in this recruiting cycle. Oh yeah. I mean, it crushed all momentum because, you know, kids didn't know. And then you, and we lost a lot of kids. We were, we were, that were leaning us like Marcus Wimberly out of Arkansas, who was one of my personal favorites. He was going to commit to Michigan because Jay Harbaugh was recruiting him at safety's position, um, but they're gone. So he's, I mean, he's going to visit in the summer, but I don't know, you know, a Southern kid, they're hard to pull. Um, yeah. We lost a lot of momentum with a lot of for kids. Some schools they are. For what? I'm just kidding. Oh, I said for well, some schools they are. Yeah, right. No, I mean, hey, Ohio, hey, I don't know though. Miami's been uh, the Florida schools been pulling their kids back from you guys, Mark. Uh, I know last uh, last deadline you guys lost a few kids, but uh, no, I mean Michigan definitely has a hard time with Southern kids. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean it definitely didn't help. It definitely did hurt. And when you have a whole new coaching staff, you have to build new relationships. And Sharon Moore is now. I mean, the entire month of February was getting the coaching staff together, building the NIL program or the the infrastructure for the NIL in terms of hiring Sean McGee. And then we just saw uh, one of our uh, directors of uh, – shoot, what's his name? We just got him from Georgia. I'm trying – I got it right here. I think his name is John Collins. Uh, I think he's the director of operations now. He was formerly at Georgia. So he's building the, uh, the, per the player personnel recruiting department. Yeah, well, he's the assistant director of recruiting, John Collins. Uh, previously of Georgia. So like he's, he's building this infrastructure of, of these, of, of these, uh, of these guys who are in the know, they understand the recruiting game. And uh, you know, I don't know. It kind of just feels like we're getting our, we're, we're now jumping in the pool. Everyone has started the race and we're now, we're now swimming. Yeah. It's and, good way uh, and, it's, yeah. and it's April. So it's a little concerning. I will, I'll tell you this though. I think our NIL strategy is making the road a lot harder than it should be currently. I, I, I still don't have full confidence in our NIL strategy at the high school level. In terms of player retainment, I do think we have a good NIL strategy. But uh, high school prospects, I, they, I haven't seen it yet. You know, I just haven't seen the tangible evidence. Folks, we've got about 150 online, and many of you are joining us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, that is something that we're going to carry forward uh, in regards to the online experience and joining the show, but we would love to have you on YouTube because the reason why you can comment in the comment section. So we appreciate that. Uh, before we get to our next topic here real quick, want to let everyone know here, starting in less than two weeks, it'll be Monday the 15th. We've got a whole new different kind of show here, at the voice of college football. If I can get up in time, 8 AM every day, Monday through Thursday, actually starting again, April 15th. So tax day, we're going to brighten tax day for you with wake up college football, a whole different uh, look at the voice of college football. And you, you can find out what that's all about starting on April 15th. Uh, Ferris, I believe you still had some thoughts about who maybe not particular players, but position groups that Michigan should be targeting in the transfer portal. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we, we talked about quarterback, you know, from a, from a scoring perspective, you know, I've kind of scored, you know, uh, players who've left players and the experience that players have now, uh, at the bottom of the list on offense is, uh, quarterback. You know, I don't think Michigan should get a, a transfer quarterback, but 
Uh, I'm just telling you what the, what the numbers say. Uh, second on the list is uh, wide receivers. Um, and then, you know, just sort of the, de- I, the way I look at the offensive line is I it, just think of like, there's this massive wall that was kind of built, you know, I, I'm thinking of like uh, Lord of the Rings or something, some huge wall. And then it's the whole wall has gone, you know, and now, now we're in a second, a second wall is being built, but, but now it's kind of partially built. It's not as, it's not as big or uh, uh, as, as that first wall. So um, uh, we just have to keep, keep it rolling with respect to that offensive line. Um, You know, that that's on the offensive side Um, on the defensive side. We're probably, I mean, it's, uh, Mike Sanistrill would is who I would say is is the biggest uh, loss that we had. Even with Rod Moore leaving, uh, you, you know we were very you know kind of fortunate um, to have Quentin Johnson come back. So so uh, you know I think we're okay there. Uh, the that middle linebacker, the uh, Jayshon uh, Barnum. It was great to hear that that he's doing well because that's the other position that I I have a question to mark about and say. Hey, we we probably need to do something about that that position there. Um, uh, TJ, I don't. Did you mention anything about Jair Hill? And I, I didn't, but there is some intel in, in terms of the cornerback two position uh, with Jair Hill and DJ Waller. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious on that because I have that kind of as a little bit of a negative, but not not a huge negative. But uh, yeah, I'm just curious yeah. what you think about that one. So yeah, so uh, all indications are DJ Waller is leading the battle right now, and it is a Jire Hill DJ Waller battle. Um, I actually think from you know the, the recent reports out of camp is uh, I think Michigan feels fairly confident in the CB two. And I would agree with you that the nickelback position that is vacated by Sandra still is a concern. I, I know they tried filling it in December with Upton Stout, uh, the defensive back out of uh, Western Kentucky. But unfortunately, he wanted to play a negotiation game with Michigan after he was a silent commit on a visit, by the way. Um, and then Michigan pulled the offer. And, and, and obviously, this was pre hardball NFL dancing, eventually moving on to the Chargers. So I do think nickelback is going to be a, a position that they, they target. Mm-hmm. Um, but I so but touching on some of the other positions, and I actually have a question for you on maybe you know how you're you're drawing your uh, positions of, uh, of need. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but you know, in terms of like wide receiver, no question, we need a wide receiver X. We need a receiver above six two. We just don't have that in the uh, you know the current arsenal of our wide receivers. We have a lot of Y types and Z types. Um, yeah, we just don't have the big body receiver who can you know. Mm-hmm. contest the catch jump for the ball and stretch the field so yeah i think last um, week we had talked about peyton o'leary do, do you have any more info on him i don't have any info on him but he would fit that archetype right i mean he's he's that type but is he is he is he ready i don't know i will find out in spring ball or maybe if more news leaks or if the offense can get in rhythm and we can get more uh wide receiver intel because i'm sure there's just not a lot of it right now the way the defense is playing um but yeah, I mean, the positions in need, in my opinion, uh, are wide receiver X. I agree with you. Nickelback, I agree. And I would have said safety with the Rod Moore injury, which sucks. It still bothers me. You know, it just oh, it makes me feel so dirty. Um, but uh, Brandon Hillman, Zeke Berry, and uh, Quentin Johnson are co- going to compete for that position. So I don't see them going in the transfer portal to fill that because they have three guys competing for that position. But all right, so if you so. When you do your analysis, mm-hmm. what what are you using to uh, identify a, a position of weakness? Yeah, yeah, gl- gl- glad you asked. I mean, uh, so basically, uh, so I'm taking draft picks that are leaving. Now, <laughs> Michigan's in kind of a totally unique situation, uh, especially on offense, where there's potentially 11 players are going to get drafted on offense, right? So, um, but both on offense and defense, if a player is leaving. Uh, I basically give give a high, medium, or low in terms of um, kind of a value to them, and that's based on where they're going to be picked in the draft. And there's a little bit of wiggle room there. You know, at first I I made I said you know losing Mike Sanistrill for sure. I don't care where he's drafted. That that's that's a huge loss, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then I took returning players. If the returning players are the number of games they played in at least had an appearance in last year. You know, I gave one point for each of those. I, I gave either, you know, minus 20 or minus 15 or minus 10 for players that are leaving. 
then I gave one point for each each player that's coming um, uh, that's coming back in terms of appearances in 2023. I pick three star. I kind of used hockey rules here. I picked three stars on offense, three stars on defense, and I and I uh, gave five bonus points. So if, if you're curious, I gave uh, Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, and Will Johnson uh, a defensive five five point bonus. And then on uh, let me get my offense. My offense, I gave uh, Samaj Morgan, Colston Loveland, and Donovan Edwards five bonus points for that uh, for for being stars. Mm. Um, and then I took second string and I tried to figure out, OK, you know, the second string, how many games did they play in last year? And then I basically valued that in half. You know, I gave 50 percent value to that. So I came up with a, you know, this is kind of an initial scoring mechanism just to kind of say, OK, um, you know, can this beat the returning production number that ESPN has, you know, in terms of better understanding you know, players are leaving where the gaps are, you know, maybe there's some young superstars that are coming in. Okay. That's, that's possible. But at the very least, let's, let's just see how much of a loss that we have with JJ McCarthy and can Alex Orgy fill that? Well, he only played in six games. So, uh, you know, and, and JJ is a minus 20. So you, you're losing 20 because JJ's leaving Alex Orgy's uh, coming in. He only played in six games. You know, you kind of do the math that way. Right. So that, that's okay. how I did it. Okay. Mm -hmm. all right guys and finally tonight uh and we remind everyone the amazon links in the description section of all the videos when you shop on amazon please use that link and of course it's easy just to hit the like button so do that before you take off follow tj at ronin sports talk you'll see the banner here in just a second uh but there are rumblings around the nfl circles with the nfl draft coming up uh, the final weekend of April about J.J. McCarthy going northeast here to possibly be the next great New England Patriots quarterback. Yeah. In the, so in the last 24 hours, and, and you, you know, uh, please chat if you in, in the chat, just put, leave a little message if, if you think this is real or not. But in the last 24 hours, uh, you know, I've been hearing and I'm I, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, so. You know, I'm plugged into at least the media there, but there is there's a huge uh, surge in interest uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, the Patriots being a match for JJ. And, you know, some people think it's a smoke screen, smoke screen. Um, you know, when I analyze the numbers, I, I think JJ's problem is that he has a low denominator. And I guess what I mean by that, he has low pass attempts relative to other players. But he's well into the 70s in terms of completions. Uh, he has a very, very solid passer efficiency rating. He's 27 and one as a quarterback. And, um, you know, he has never even played a down at age 21. He, he, you know, his Michigan career ended at age 20. So um, I could see him being a relatively high floor with a really high ceiling too. So, so um, I could see how a GM could talk themselves into JJ being a, you know, top 10 pick, certainly top five pick, maybe uh, Patriots at number three, uh, either, either they're, you know, they're thinking like I'm thinking and they, and they saw that play, uh, you know, that one play that we all remember from the Rose Bowl, where we caught that ball one handed, uh, that lateral pass, and then he threw it on a dime, you know, like a perfect throw uh, as he was getting crushed. Um, you know, may maybe they think, OK, we've seen the tape of where he's at his best. We see his numbers and we think, you know what, um, you know, it, it, NBA, uh, you know, NBA drafts, they kind of work this way, too, where you see sort of lukewarm statistics in college and all of a sudden players explode when they when they go to uh, uh, the NBA. So, you know, this may be uh, more analogous to that type of situation. Certainly his stats, if you just look at the stat sheet, it's not going to compare with many of the other top quarterbacks. Interested to get your thoughts on that. Those are mine. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some truth to it because, you know, a lot of the, some of the word coming out of like NFL circles is the concern with Drake May, May is his inconsistency, right? So sometimes he looks very elite. And then there's other times where he makes throws and they're wondering what's going on. You know, is it a mechanic issue? Is it in his head? 
you know, he just lacks consistency at times. And with JJ, um, he's just well-rounded. I mean, you know, again, like the biggest knock on JJ is not JJ, it's the system, right? So that is kind of, uh, you know, NFL teams look at that and it's kind of like the NBA, right? They draft on potential. And because of JJ's age, as you mentioned, and and because of his, you know, his talent and his skill set, um, I think it's possible he is the third quarterback taken. I think there are GMs debating, you know, when they do their big boards, right? Who? Well, I think we all would agree. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels are battling one and two. I'm sure it's not unanimous. And then who's number three? And it, it probably is a debate between Drake, uh, Drake May, and JJ McCarthy. And you know, personally, I could see him going as high as three. I think Minnesota at six is a likely destination, and I don't think he falls any further than 11, which is the Giants. So I would, I would um, argue. He probably isn't – I'm sure Minnesota's going to draft him because they need a quarterback bad. Um, but if it's not uh, Minnesota, then it very well could be uh, the New England Patriots. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, see, I see Charger – you know, uh, D-Rock Rock, uh, Irish uh, mentions Chargers. Uh, I'm sure J- Harbaugh would love to have J.J., but uh, he already has a quarterback and he has a massive cap, cap hit if he wants to make that trade, and, and his quarterback's pretty good. So – I don't see him doing that. So, <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. All right, TJ, uh, let folks know uh, what they can find uh, with you at uh, Ronan Sports Talk. Yeah, so uh, you can get me on uh, Twitter, uh, Ronan Sports Talk. Uh, a lot of Michigan content, some Lions content, a lot of Detroit local sports content. I mainly focus on Michigan, though. Uh, obviously, I'm regular, frequently on uh, the Wolverines Live podcast with you guys. Uh, Hello, John, if you're watching, we miss you, buddy. And, uh, you know, if uh, you want to give me a follow, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Ferris, knocking out some content for us here at the Voice of College Football. Yes. Uh, So, uh, as mentioned earlier, two videos coming out um, in the next couple days. Uh, And I'm probably going to dive a little bit more into the JJ the JJ in the draft uh, situation as well. Uh, A lot of people seem to be interested in that, uh, both within the Michigan universe and, and, and outside. Uh, so um, look for uh, multiple videos coming out soon. Really being, I really appreciate being part of part of this show on Tuesdays. It's, it's awesome. Great. Thank you I learned a lot here. from TJ. T- TJ is really Absolutely. smart. Thank you. Thank you, Ferris. Me as well, Ferris, me as well. But uh, a lot of people learning things from you now with uh, your video posts here at the Voice of College Football. So, Ferris, appreciate you being here. TJ, you know that as well. Thank you for your contribution, your analysis, and everything that you do for us. Uh, we don't have a, a show here without great analysts to, uh, to learn from and to tap into. Our next show is USC Live. That means I'll be right here at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific tonight with Tim Prangley and Matt Zemek from Trojans Wire. That's over on the USC channel, folks. Remember, they are in the Big Ten, Michigan fans, so you can go on over there, troll, trash talk, do whatever you want. Just be there, and we'll see you at 11 Eastern.